Hello and welcome to the hard sell where the stick in the swill bucket rattles back. Remember this notion? Where I look at print adverts in old magazines and things? Well, I was surprisingly popular when I piloted it. More importantly, I enjoyed doing it. Yes, I am more important than you. I'm the content producer, you're just the people I rely on for heat, food and shelter. Anyway, there was no way I wasn't going to do it again, so here it is again. Complete with obscure Graham Cox and reference. Happiness in magazines. This time we're looking at a pull-out colour supplement from the News of the World, which they called Sunday. Oh, what a giveaway. Chris Oakley found it, so thanks to him. It's from May 1983, and it has Dave Bowie of the Dave Bowie Band on the cover, as shot by David Bailey, in his tanned, sharp-suited Let's Dance commercial phase, which actually makes the headline even odder. Now you ask this? Now he's working with Nile Rogers and dressing like a normal person? This question didn't occur when he was dressing as a sad clown walking down a neon beach or being painted as a mulleted man-dog complete with bollocks. Of course, that's the whole point. Oh, certainly he's acting normal. Ho, ho, ho. This is the news of the world, not uh, not something that isn't shit. Anyway, never mind that. Let's look at what's being sold to us six weeks or so before I'm born. <laughs> okay. All right. Breathing through my nose. In case you weren't aware, I am Cornish. It's a Celtic outpost on the extreme southwestern peninsula of the United Kingdom. Think Wales, but smaller without the recognition. We have a lot of traditions, like incomprehensibility and nice beaches, and our national dish, the Cornish pasty. It's a parcel of meat, onions and root vegetables in short crust pastry. It is spectacularly bad for you and completely brilliant. One of the biggest companies in Cornwall, now that we don't mind tin anymore, is Ginsters. And yes, I know it's owned by two guys from Leicester. Shut up. Factory still in Cannington. Ginsters make and sell pasties for chiller cabinets nationwide. Ginsters pasties are bloody horrible, because they're mass-produced for reheating, which defeats the purpose. But they're definitely Cornish pasties, made according to the official geographically protected recipe. Like sherry. Real sherry comes only from Spain. Thanks for that. Or Melton Mowbray pork pies. You cannot make a pasty any other way and claim it as Cornish. It's been that way since 2011. Geographical protection for our national dish. And adverts like this one for Tesco are why we needed that recognition. Let's go through it, shall we? Perhaps the only place outside of Truro, fuck you, there's 82 miles worth of Cornwall outside of our one city, you can get a traditional Cornish pasty, is inside of Tesco. Mm. Made with a delicious light short crust pastry. Okay, I'll give you that. 
It is technically permissible to use puff pastry, but it needs to be so strong and unyielding, you might as well just use short crust anyway. Besides, it tastes better. And bursting with potatoes, minced beef, onions, and carrots. No. Nope. Yeah. Wrong. Carrots. Carrots! Are you kidding me? That's just basic sacrilege. It's not even an interesting blasphemy. That is the obvious thing to get wrong. Carrots. Fuck off, it's Swede. Something in the Turner family at the very least, but Swede for preference. Not fucking carrots, for fuck's sake. And then look at the picture. The picture doesn't actually seem to be of the pasty that the copy is describing, because the picture does actually seem to include some Swede. But then, what the fuck is this? This red thing? Then a carrot? Is that a bit of a bell pepper? Is that a bell pepper in a pasty? Are you insane? But worse of all, before the carrots, before whatever those red things are, minced beef. Minced beef. Mince. Oh, sure, sure. Use mince. Use mince if you don't give a shit and you're just a bad person. But if you actually want a Cornish pasty, you use fresh chuck steak. Or skirt if you're in a hurry. In a pinch, braising steak. Raw, naturally, as well as the vegetables, because you wrap them up in the pastry, pour on a healthy dose of pepper, not, note, bell peppers, and cook them all up as one, so they're cooked within the pastry shell. That's the point. And it goes on. The same authentic shape and distinctive crimped top. Okay, now you're just trolling. Crimped fucking top. That's a Devon pasty. That's what the people the other side of the Tamar did when we introduced it to them. They turned it into an ovular blob with crimps down the middle because they didn't get it. It's a handle. It's for holding the damn thing. It goes on the side, you idiot. And then as the final insult, we're quietly confident you won't be able to tell the difference between a Tesco Cornish pasty and a Cornish Cornish pasty, even if you happen to come from Cornwall. Yeah, well, I do happen to come from Cornwall, which is how I can tell that this thing is about as authentically Cornish as Ricky Fulton. And I honestly wouldn't mind, because Ginster's pasties are both authentic and bloody horrible. But they're good enough for Emmett's and the English. What's really egregious here is the more Cornish than thou attitude Tesco are showing despite clearly not knowing the first thing about what they're talking about. As Cornish as they come, fuck off. This is half as Cornish as ABBA. If you're going to do a campaign like this, you better come correct, and they didn't even try. And I suspect it's because they didn't think us Cornish were worth trying for. It's only the Cornish who gives a shit. Sadly, they were probably right. We get no respect, no respect at all. Now also, jam first. So anyway, that was certainly a thing, wasn't it? But surely there are other adverts in here somewhere that presumably won't lead to quite such long, angry rants. So let's get on with it. Oh, well, speaking of Cornwall. This isn't named after Daphne, however, but her dad, the actor Sir Gerald, who was so annoyed at cigarettes irritating his throat, they invented a special blend for him. Not only smoked it, he just let them use his name in order for enough cash to pay off his tax bills. True story. Anyway, by 1983, tobacco advertising in this country, in the face of increasing regulation, has become highly abstract and light on the words. With human beings effectively discouraged, and something like a fifth of the space taken up by the health warning. 
You can still show the box, however, which helps to Moria no end. They're going for a colour-coded brand evocation thing like Benson and Hedges, but they're nowhere near as iconic. So it's a good thing they can still appear in person, as it were. Also, Lotar. Remember how that was a thing in the early 80s, as a sort of light diet form of smoking, except that it was bollocks and made no difference, but useful for advertising purposes? Yeah, that's still a thing. Perfect coordination. Well, nearly. If any one of them was wearing a platinum blonde perm, they'd look almost perfectly in photo negatives of each other. Why this would be desirable, I'm not sure, but then I wasn't born yet. Knitted tops and linen jackets and lady trousers. Oh, sorry, linen look jackets and etc. This isn't CNA, you know. No, in fact, it's Asda, with their pre-George Asdale range. It's quite novel at this point for supermarkets to sell clothes, and in fact, Asda themselves seem to have forgotten Asdale ever existed. Guess dressing up as conceptual vice versa wasn't popular after all. But even or not, we're not even at the contents page yet. This might be a colour supplement, but it's still 1983, and even the news of the world can't afford colour on every page. Colour is for important things, like the commercials that make them money, and if that means front-loading the magazine with ads, then so be it. Some things are immutable, however, and after the article about Dave, which is barely two pages long, we get an appearance for the Franklin Mint, the legendary mail order tat company for lonely people. Today they've studied minute traces of precious gemstones into slivers of sterling silver and will sell them to you over the course of a few months for 15 quid each, which is about 36 quid today. And by a few months I mean five years, because there's 63 of the bastards. This price is guaranteed apart from any potential change in the rate of VAT, which I suppose there might well be over the course of five fucking years, so yeah, if that sounds like a good deal to you, please punch yourself in the face. The Franklin Mint. Never forget that we're aimed at the kind of people impressed by this kind of writing. Moving on. Oh, more cigarettes. This one's fairly straightforward. Yay, these things. Fireworks. Ta-da. The rules and regs won't let us do anything more sophisticated than this. Well, actually, they will, but that sounds hard, and we can't be asked. Fair enough. Look, everyone, it's the late Una Stubbs, and she's advertising wallpaper. Sorry, wally paper, which is apparently nicer than wallpaper, even though that's what it is. It's a very confused advert. And then the copy is apparently written in Una's voice and desperately wants you to get excited about some wallpaper, even though the best it can really manage is, there's plain ones and patterned ones. And then because it's 1983, you're supposed to clip out that little form saying you like the cut of Wally Paper's jib. They'll send you a brochure. That was commonplace back in slower times, of course. Here's another home improvement example from Crystal Tiles. The copy reads like pornography for the boring. Basically, if there's a yawning void in your soul and only tiles can fill it, these people can help. Well, enable. And again, there's a cut-out what's name for you to use to demand a brochure. But then over the page, spoiling everything, look. Do it all. A whole supermarket of DIY supplies. You don't need to send off for a brochure. You can just go out and buy some tiles right now. For some reason, do it all and get four whole pages to themselves here. And the third page is full of car-related items, like turtle wax and motor oil, right in time for a downright autoerotic two-page spread on the Audi Quattro, because 1983. And to round off this testosterone-soaked section of the magazine, Benson and Hedges, evoking the manly vocation of the blacksmith. Do it all aren't the only ones who've paid over the odds. Access, the credit card, gets three pages. Although it doesn't actually do much with the first one. Doesn't do an awful lot with the other two either, to be honest, although I'm glad the answer's upside down thing is just some kind of joke that didn't land properly and I don't have to faff around flipping and stuff. This is basically an advert explaining the concept of credit cards for new adopters. Like most things, they started out as aspirational items aimed at the elite and wannabe elite, but eventually these things come into reach of the proletariat. 
Cash Money Dosh is the concern of this bit of the magazine, in fact, with the excess advert coming before an article about the great poker player Jack Strauss and how much money he's won. And then after that is another finance advert, which I don't quite get. What would my friend say? Probably your conversational skills have really declined lately. Was this a real thing? Financial peer pressure on this basic level? People concerned about how they'd look to their friends if they opened a savings account? Because I can't imagine anyone really giving a shit about it outside of hardcore yuppie circles. And in that case, it's such a basic move it would barely register. Apart from that, the suggestions for what they will say are mostly really negative. Not negative in that they're negative sentiments, but negative in that they paint a really grim picture of what the Britannia Building Society thinks is your personality. Most of them are about making them jealous and resentful of your success. And I understand that this was the main motivator of action in the 1980s in particular, but it's still kind of bleak to have it delivered so directly. A few pages later, something to buy with all your money that you've saved up specifically to hurt others. A car stereo. Yeah, there was a time when cars didn't all come with a sound system and the internet as standard, and even an FM radio was something of a luxury. It was for us. Here's a cassette radio from Pioneer, who are apparently one of the most venerable and reliable names in cast areas, and still exist to this day, unlike the majority of things in this magazine. The copy seems to be trying a bit too hard to be cool in places. The conversational tone backfires a little when it starts to go into the details, and it's hard not to picture a slightly over earnest salesman in a leather jacket that he clearly doesn't own and doesn't know how to wear, growing distant and hoarse and slightly turgid as he discusses the feather-touch buttons and quartz PLL synthesizer tuner. And at the end of all that, they throw in a free cassette containing the likes of Men at Work, The Stranglers, Toto, Journey, Jim Steinman, and Rachel Sweet. All that 1983 goodness. On the inside back cover, there's an advert for fitted kitchens. I'm just going to skip over because it's your standard information overload. And then at the back, another cigarette advert. Another one based around the colour of the pack in lieu of anything more specific to hang the concept on. It's okay. It makes a pun around the brand name. So it's got that going for it. Which is nice. Obviously, this wouldn't work in this day and age when all cigarette packs look the same, i.e. deliberately hideously ugly, and have to be asked for by name at the kiosk anyway. But that's because we're a long, long way from it being acceptable to advertise these things at all. It's still acceptable to sell them, of course, but that's because the industry is clever and has framed it as a neutral lifestyle choice rather than the addict-pusher relationship it really is. And on that cheery note, the magazine ends. That really went round the houses of 1980s obsessions and demographics. Eerily coordinated fashions, middle-class wallpaper, extreme grouting, aspirational finance, wrong pasties, state-of-the-art technology, and obviously enough tobacco to guarantee another 30 years of the You and Me in the Big C podcast. And because it's a Sunday colour supplement, the Franklin Mint with a load of old bollocks which, unlike the tobacco, remains immutable to this day. Of course, these days, every page is in colour. Us millennials don't know we're born. just sat through a Bob the Fish production. Nice! If you haven't already, you absolutely must check out bobthefish.org.uk. Literally hundreds more videos, not unlike that one, adding up to days worth of entertainment and all absolutely free. But if you're not a cold-hearted skinflint, you can always support us on Patreon. 
For as little as anything at all, you can make programmes like the one you just watched possible in the first place, and become eligible for bonus material, such as glimpses of the book I'm writing about the BBC, monthly riffings on random commercial breaks, the complete archives of the angry political satire magazine Two Sons, and even the odd very occasional bonus video essay unavailable anywhere else. If nothing else, you should prevent me from starving and or freezing to death in the foreseeable future, so that'd be nice. No pressure or anything. BobTheFish.org.uk You make it what it is. (laughs) 